Um, hello everybody. I'm um, my name is Henry Ali Ahmed. I'm a PhD student um, at uh, Royal Holloway. I'm in the second year of um, my PhD and I'm working with Palestinian refugees in the Lebanon. Um, so uh, it's sort of become apparent um, from recent um, events in this country certainly that uh, this idea of uncertainty sort of popped into my mind and the fact that uh, people keep talking about it here, you know, they've lived uh, since the um, unfortunate referendum in this state of uncertainty. So um, I, it's made me think about the Palestinian people that I'm working with because they've lived in uncertainty, some of them for 70 years. So um, this idea um, that their past has gone, their present um, is being erased and, and in some cases their future's gone as well. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Oh, here we are. Right, as um, my project is, is about people, um, I decided to um, show you some of those people and, and maybe let their stories speak uh, for themselves. Um, all of the people that I have brought today have given full permission uh, for me to use their pictures. And I would like to say, if anybody could take a picture of me with the last slide, um, I will WhatsApp it to the gentleman involved because he'll be all over it later on and have it um, all over his social media because he'll think it's fantastic. So, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say that. So this gentleman um, is uh, called Mahmoud Dakwa and um, he, in his own words, was thrown out of Palestine at the age of 11 um, and he is now... 83 now, she was 82 I think when this picture was, take, was um, taken and he's sitting in the middle of his archive. Now this is an archive that he has gathered since he retired as um, a school headmaster at an UNRWA school um, which is the UN school um, in, in South Lebanon where he lives um, and he has over 3,000 books and about three and a half thousand Palestinian objects that have been used or passed through Palestine uh, before 1948. So Milton makes that very, very clear. Um, but, uh, you know, working with him, he collects all this material. He's written books about this material, but he doesn't really talk about in his books about his story. And that is something that I, I am using um, sort of archaeological methods to, to bring his story out, to find out his personal experiences. Um, and I've met with him a few times and I'm and, and, and in contact um, with him. But he wants to preserve everything from the past. Um, and he's doing that through objects and through documents as well. That doesn't include the books that he has, um, which is a public library. He's used all of his retirement money. He lives in one room um, very, very humbly. Um, and this is, is all of his retirement money is actually this museum. Um, which I do suggest anybody goes to visit if you happen to be in, um, in uh, Tia or Sur in South Lebanon. So I'm going to move on to my next one of my other participants. Oh, wrong way, sorry. Here we are. Um, now this is uh, Jihad, Jihad Dakwa, and he was, his own words, thrown out of Palestine at the age of eight. Um, so uh, he's written seven books. Um, on, on Palestine, but again, not his own story. And he doesn't really talk about his own story. And one of the, um, one of the most poignant things that he, he said to me um, was that he misses, um, I, I said to him, was there anything that he missed? And he started talking about a box that he had when he was a child, that he kept um, buttons and a couple of seashells and little trinkets in. And I'm going to use the word haunted because he is haunted by that. And, and um, the reason I'm using the word haunted is I think if you weren't using these um, sort of archaeological methods to question people about their feelings and about their things, then nobody would have ever known about that. I said to him, who, who have you told about this box? And he hasn't even told his wife about that box. But he said the older that he gets, the more um, important that box becomes, something that's completely lost. He, he never knew what happened to it. And I think that illustrates really clearly sort of what has been lost uh, by some of these people, because 
um, well, by all of them, actually, that they've lost, sort of, for him, it was his, his life as a child, as something that we can all connect to, um, that is um, lost. So, oops, just going to say something. Um, this is uh, another gentleman I met and his lovely wife. It's Ali Noof, what a fantastic name, and his wife, uh, Layla. And um, again, this is a, another man who's written a book about his village. Um, and his village was called Luvia. And um, a few years ago, he was lucky enough to meet a gentleman who was traveling in South Lebanon as a tourist, who was then going um, to Palestine afterwards. And he asked him to visit the location of Luvia. So this gentleman did, and um, there is absolutely nothing left. So we're talking about marginalised and erased people. There is no evidence of his village there at all. Lydia does not exist, apart from a broken well cap, which is a stone. And he showed me a picture of that when I visited him. But again, he's written a book to try and collect all this information. But he doesn't mention his feelings about that well cap in his book. Um, it's about gathering the evidence, as, as the other people I've spoken about want to collect, collect and gather this evidence, but it's not about their own feelings. Um, so I, that's why I think it's really, really important that you are talking to um, people of marginalised communities and using questioning and inquiry in a sensitive manner, because that's obviously um, very important. But I, and, and, um, but it, it's really important to try and get to this sort of undercurrent. The, the, uh, there's another sort of narrative going on, their own one that maybe they're not saying in these books or the objects that they are collecting. Um, now, those three people I talked about there, all first generation um, Palestinians, I, they lived in Palestine, Palestine as children. Um, but I've also met another group of people um, who are all second generation. I haven't met anybody. Um, who, who actually comes from this particular village uh, that I'm going to talk about now. This village here um, used to be called Hanin, and I'm actually standing in Lebanon when I took this picture, and that village over there is now um, called Majilot, and um, it's uh, obviously been resettled, and the uh, Hanin castle, which is a crusader castle, is actually just on this hill here, um, and I've met a lot of people that are actually from um, this village, um, or their fathers and mothers were from this village. And um, again, I've been talking to them and um, trying to find out what is driving them to um, still want to go back, because they do. It's not, they, they haven't experienced this village but many of them stand in this particular spot on Sunday to demonstrate and look at this village. So I'm, I'm using, I think it's important, and archaeology can try and uncover some of that um, to try and find out what it is that's driving them um, to want to go back. Um, why is that? I mean, it's a kilometre. Why, what, what is it about this place that, that they are so... Um, so uh, enta in, um, entangled with what, what is it about their heritage that ties them to this place? And I think that we can use archaeology to, to try and um, explain or understand that. And it is about understanding. And um, this gentleman here is third generation post Nazi. It's how I'm starting to refer to people. So Samar is 18. When I met him, he was 17 and a half, and I did have an ethical issue about interviewing him, but he was absolutely adamant that he was old enough to get married, so therefore he was old enough to say whether he could, I could interview him, so I was like, okay. So, um, he's a barber, and um, the reason I'm telling you that is that I think it's important that people understand that in Lebanon, Palestinians have absolutely nothing. They don't have any citizenship, they are completely stateless. They, um, there are more than 70 jobs that they are not allowed to do. You can't become a lawyer, you can't be a professional. Um, and so I really think this illustrates that um, it's not only their past and their presence that's sort of been erased, um, but it's also their future. 
Um, I have a son that's a few years older than um, Sam and I like to sort of think that he has all these prospects ahead of him and then think about Sam, what, what prospects does he have? Um, you know, what does his future hold? But he is very, very keen for people to hear his story, for people to understand what it's like to be Palestinian. And um, I've had some quite in-depth conversations with him. Again, he is fiercely Palestinian. He's not, um, he's not a kafir-wrapped terrorist. You can see he's wearing a kafir here. He's not a violent person. He's not, um, I haven't found any evidence of him um, you know, being unpleasant in any way, shape or form. He's a really nice young man who works hard, but he is also an archivist. In fact, every single person that I've talked about here is collecting information, documents, objects, and they're archiving them. Um, Summer actually does it digitally rather than materially, but he is collecting all of those documents and he's quite active in sharing those documents with other people, particularly on social media. He photographs them and, and becomes active. And I've got one minute left. So um, what I'd like to say is um, I think it's really important that um, if you use archaeological methods that um, you can uncover people. I actually should, I should said that the wrong way around. Uh, Mortimer Wheeler, you know, says archaeology is about people, and it is. And somebody in one of the talks yesterday said that archaeology is the keepers of the dead. And I didn't challenge them on it, but I was thinking, no, we're not. Um, we try and find evidence of life and, and to understand and explain life, even in the dead. But I'm dealing with the living, but it is about their lives. It's about life and... Um, you know, I, I see myself as um, a facilitator of their story coming out, does that make sense? But I'm not going to speak for them, I want them to be able to speak for themselves. But I think it's an a archaeologist's um, say job, but um, you know, it's our role that we could play is to uh, facilitate in marginalised people getting their story out there to, to um, allow other people to understand uh, their situation better and that's what I'm going to say. Thank you.